So the question of home in some way obsesses every single part of my whole body of work and this poem included. Um, the story behind this poem is that I went to uh, Marco Island, a place out of my childhood uh, into my adolescence, a place we used to vacation to all the time. Um, and I hadn't been there in about 20, 25 years. And of course I thought nothing had changed because in some ways we feel like our, our memories don't change, therefore our, these places are not supposed to change. And so I realized uh, this is kind of, this poem sort of speaks to that adage, you can't go back home in some ways. Um, and it relates in, in a sense to also my parents' story as Cuban immigrants who always used to, who always used to talk about Cuba in this way, about what was, how it had changed or what wasn't there, what was missing. And I realized that Marco Island, this place, this Gulf Motel, in some ways became my, the equivalent of my Cuba, my own lost place. Looking for the Gulf Motel, Marco Island, Florida. There should be nothing here, I don't remember. The Gulf Motel with mermaid lampposts and ship's wheel in the lobby should still be rising out of the sand like a cake decoration. My brother and I should still be pretending we don't know our parents, embarrassing us as they roll the luggage cart past the front desk, loaded with our scruffy suitcases, two dozen loaves of Cuban bread, brown bags bulging with enough mangoes to last the entire week, our espresso pot, the pressure cooker, and a pork roast reeking garlic through the lobby. All because we can't afford to eat out, not even on vacation. Only two hours from our home in Miami, but far enough away to be thrilled by the wider sands on the west coast of Florida, where I should still be for the first time watching the sun set instead of rise over the ocean. There should be nothing here, I don't remember. My mother should still be in the kitchenette of the Gulf Motel, her daisy sandals from Kmart squeaking across the linoleum, still gorgeous in her teal swimsuit and amber earrings, stirring a pot of arroz con pollo, adding sprinkles of onion powder and dollops of tomato sauce. My father should still be in a tear cloth jacket, smoking, clinking a glass of amber whiskey in the sunset at the Gulf Motel, watching us dive into the pool, two boys he'll never see grow into men who will be proud of him. There should be nothing here I don't remember. My brother and I should still be playing Parcheesi. My father should still be alive, slow dancing with my mother on the sliding glass balcony of the Gulf Motel. No music. Only the waves keeping time, a song only their minds here, 10,000 nights back to their life in Cuba. My mother's face should still be resting against his bare chest, like the moon resting on the sea, and the stars should still be turning around them. There should be nothing here I don't remember. My brother should still be 13, sneaking rum in the bathroom and sculpting naked women from sand. And I, I should still be eight years old, dazzled by seashells and how many seconds I can hold my breath underwater. But I'm not. I'm 38, driving up Collier Boulevard, looking for the Gulf Motel, for everything that should still be, but isn't. I want to blame the condos, their shadows for ruining the beach and my past. I want to chase the snowbirds away with their tacky McMansions and yachts. I want to turn the golf courses back into mangroves. I want to find the golf motel exactly as it was and pretend for a moment nothing lost is lost. One thing that strikes me about this poem and makes me love it even more is how natural and idiomatic and unaffected the speaking voice is and you know the voice of someone gripped by moving recollections and yet how meticulously formed <laughs> this poem 
is I must tell you that a pork roast reeking garlic through the lobby may be my favorite pentameter <laughs> line of all time, right? Take that. And I'm going to use that. Next time we'll do some Wordsworth and then we'll do a pork roast <laughs> reeking garlic through the lobby. And so that, you know, we might pretend that this isn't a poem, but it is a poem. Uh, written not in perfect blank verse, but in very beautiful Thank blank you. verse that reminds us what the form of a poem is, is for and what form and an older form can do. Does that make sense to you? Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, I think, I think part, of, part of what I always try to have that kind of conversational language in my work, um, because after all, the subject matter as well that I'm dealing with, it is this working class family going to going to on this staycation basically before that word ever really existed <laughs> yeah. um, but it is it is also very carefully structured and also the placement of the images to me was very important and and also I think what I think what makes it not just sort of a narrative sort of nostalgic sort of is is that is that refrain right so it begins already with a note that says wait there's something else going on here than just a trip down memory lane. And, and the, to me, the way I envisioned the poem was that it starts spinning you into, like spiraling you into, and then you realize by the third stanza, wait, the parents died, I mean, the father died, and here they are dancing. And then you see that the speaker's actually in this place looking for this, really driving down the very street. And the refrain gives it, r r reminds us that we're in, in a, yeah. somebody's head, right. <laughs> right? Not just in a narrative scene. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it's the, beautiful pentameter. For me, it's the evocative nature of this poem, not only what Richard has in here about his family um, and the history of going away with the family and then coming back and finding nothing there, or not exactly the same thing there, um, but it makes me recall my family, even though I never grew up in Miami, um, even though I'm not Cuban-American. Um, even though I grew up in the Bronx um, hmm. of a Jewish family. The we had embarrassing parents, too. Oh, of course we did. <laughs> of course <Everybody>. we did. <laughs> of course we did. And, and it's the details. I mean, we, don't, we didn't go with enough mangoes, but we had plenty of potato chips, you know. <laughs> we had plenty of bagels. We had, <laughs> we had all kinds of things that we would take wherever we went. And I think that and from my... And it's the domestic. It's yes. not just that there are things, but they are the things that provide family comfort and that tell us there's someone who's taking care of us. Yeah, yeah. Although, taking care of us, there's the espresso pot is a grown-up kind of <laughs> taking care of. And I, I love the way the world of children and the world of parents are very warmly blended as they, you know, this they're living in this little little right, right, hotel right. room and at the same time the mystique of parents and of their romantic life oh, just is preserved that. in a beautiful in a in a space its own i was just thinking of that scene of the two of them um, yeah, dancing dancing, <laughs> dancing to no music on the balcony um, i mean that couldn't be more romantic and and to have you view that from a child's perspective is just so wonderful. I mean, to but, see that kind of love in the family. But I think it's also what, 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 what allows that to happen in the poem. It's the adult going back to the child and realizing what he did see, see that he uh, had never sort of appreciated in, a, in some ways. That's time, part of the, that's what makes it poetry. It's a complex, you know, it's more than just a, oh, my parents were, <laughs> were dancing. But it's mm. from the voice of the adult looking through the eyes of his childhood back to this thing that he kind of always dismissed, but now suddenly is missing because the physical landscape isn't there well, it's and the that, emotional landscape what can't it. find the place, right? It's that, you know, I stopped to go to just that point, I stopped over that phrase, still gorgeous, in her teal swimsuit and amber earrings, mm -hmm. stirring a pot of a rose compoyo. The glamour of this mother, still gorgeous, I'm gonna take a chance here, feels to me a little culturally specific that is not that that you would have a mother who was beautiful, who who was a vision of the nightclubs right. she'd left behind. I mean, there's a there's a Cuban nightclub scene yeah. <laughs> that um, the stars 
create yeah, yeah, and the here. Dancing and and the... that seems to be part of the the cultural mythology of Cubans. Is Am I getting something of that here? Oh, no, and even the 10,000 nights back to their life in Cuba. So it's sort of a, a nostalgia of, within a nostalgia mm -hmm. or, um, you know, one of the things that that has affected me culturally growing up as a child of, of Cuban mm -hmm. exile immigrants is that is it is always constantly about memory and it's always constantly about what was right and even though we're moving forward it's always what was what was and so this is a double what was <laughs> it was like what was their, their life in here in Cuba but it's also what is what was my life in that moment at the Gulf Motel that was also about their past and yes. this, their past and my past sort of double up in a way but it is definitely yeah part of their their own cuban or as i imagined it because i never lived in cuba so it's also my sense of their romance uh, but it's also everybody's romance of cuba exactly. when you think about cuba and I, I just how this was wrought we can't be sure but it's part of the united states imagination of cuba this is a place of nightlife right this is a place of glamour right, right. and of beauty when we talk about my family's past in the villages of Eastern Europe, nobody's talking about nightclubs, <laughs> right? It's, nope. <laughs> it's quite, when you talk to Vietnamese immigrants, they're not talking about, it. that's, it's, you've lost something that's beautiful. I want to chase the snowbirds. I want to turn the golf courses back to mangroves. I want to find, I mean, the wanting to have things exactly as they were, and at the same time, knowing as an adult, right, that, that impossible. it's impossible, which you don't know as a child. You have absolutely no idea. So it goes back to the idea of right. what you were talking about, which is really interesting to me. And the repetition, for me anyway, makes you really think about how much we want to recapture the past in varying ways, in whatever we do. Because um, so much of your work is about that and looking for, as you say, home in new settings in different ways. Um, exactly, how we want to capture our personal past, mm -hmm. our childhood past, and also our, our cultural past, mm -hmm. right? The I want neither, neither your parents nor you. Right, and that, that was... <laughs> nor a, any of us, exactly. as Maddie pointed out. That was a moment that I realized in this poem, I, well, you know, again, that it was in part that I'm, I'm, my parents weren't the only ones susceptible to that sense of loss of place and identity. Yeah, and and this is the first time in my life where I went back to a place and said, wait a minute, <laughs> this has nothing to do with, with being Cuban and everything to do with being Cuban and in the sense that perhaps I have a heightened sense of that attachment to place. For me, the formal, um, the carefully wrought quality of the poem with repetitions, I want to, I want to, with the, ins the beautiful chime of that word still, still, still throughout um, the opening lines and that the regularity of that verse is all a means of right. capturing, Entering, yeah. framing. Framing and in yeah. that suspension. It's suspension, exactly. Or even not that recently because we are a nation of immigrants and how um, reading a poem like this would remind them in some ways of things that happen somewhere else for them at another time. So that while the poem is specifically mm -hmm. about Cuba and it's specifically about your experience, it opens up a whole world for how students could be able to, um, to think about their own experiences and what they have and what they've lost. And what would their parents bring on vacation and drag through right, the lobby? Exactly. Oh, I'm sure they have all kinds of things. <laughs> uh, kimchi. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, I've shared this with, uh, yeah, with many people. And, and it's interesting that this poem particularly, for some reason, has that, what I call the mirror effect, um, mm -hmm. more than others. Uh, I, I mean, granted that I wish I was completely um, aware and did that completely pur purposefully, but obviously it's the artist's instinct that knows what's where when you're sort of drilling into something universal. Um, but this poem, more than it, everybody has a golf motel. And I agree with you that there's a beautiful universality to this poem, and yes, I can see my childhood vacation spots and 
how glamorous my parents were for that moment. My, my, I thought mine were quite glamorous as well. Um, <laughs> but I love the cultural specificity, yeah. the way this poem takes me into another. Uh, my parents would not have brought an espresso pot or a pressure cooker. And <laughs> that, and so I love fitting the details together of the amber earrings and the the sexiness and the and the maternal warmth and the fob and the sophistication of the clinking whiskey and yeah. <laughs> and the boy and the brother drinking in the bathroom. There's a there, there's there's an attitude toward life that belongs to a culture that is not mine, and I love that I journey into that in this poem.